The final three arcs of Mushoku Tensei end abruptly and without much fanfare. The events in Shiron Kingdom end with Pax's sudden suicide. The events in Millis are resolved with a straightforward negotiation session. And the battle in the Bayeral Kingdom, the final large-scale battle in the story of Mushoku Tensei, ends within minutes of Orsted's intervention, and beyond a simple description, we never even see the final fight itself. But these seemingly anticlimactic endings, the storylines that we're each appearing to build toward their own grand climax, feel perfectly satisfying. And in fact, the endings to these arcs are some of my favourite parts of the entire story of Mushoku Tensei. And it all comes down to the characters. Throughout Volume 19, we see a distant and different Zenoba from the man we've come to know quite well since his introduction back in Volume 6. After receiving a summons from his brother Pax, the new king of Sharon, Zenoba insists on returning to his homeland, uncharacteristically pushing back against Rudius's pleas for him to stay. For some unknown reason, he is wholeheartedly dedicated to being by the side of his brother, who, amidst the coup, murdered the rest of his family. When asked why he is so steadfast on returning to Sharon, he explains his strong sense of patriotic duty to the kingdom that allowed him to keep on living after he murdered his newborn brother, and later on his wife. But on being pushed further to explain why he suddenly feels so strongly about this, he has no answer. And throughout the rest of the volume, it remains this way. And we, alongside Rudius, never really understand what's going on in Zenoba's mind. On arriving in Sharon, our characters are sent to a large-scale war front at Fort Karen, the setting for, undoubtedly, the largest scale battle we have witnessed in the story so far. On winning the battle, we're informed of an unexpected siege by the Warlord Jade on the Imperial Castle, and on their arrival, our characters are forced into a battle with the Death God himself. But the battle and the flow of the volume is soon cut short. Without having reached a typical climax, and still feeling as though there is plenty of story yet to come, Pax jumps off the balcony and dies. What follows is an unexpectedly candid chapter from Zenoba's perspective, the first glimpse into his thoughts and feelings over the past 15 volumes. We see how Zenoba has slowly been influenced by the people around him. Through raising Julie, he learned that not all humans are hindrances, and in fact, they can be really pleasant to have around. Through having a friend in Rudius who has never once abandoned him, he learned to appreciate that the ginger he had always found so bothersome had actually been that same way to him his whole life. By helping out Nanahoshi in her goal of returning home, he slowly began longing for his own homeland without understanding why, and it was only after lifting Pax's corpse that he finally realised that this longing for home stemmed from his growing desire to connect with his family. A family he is only now able to truly value because of his newfound appreciation for human connection in life. After reading it, it's clear that the volume was never about building up the audience's thirst for action to pay it off with some epic battle against an apostle of the man-god. Instead, it was about building up the question of what is going through Zenoba's mind, using the audience's frustration in Zenoba's inability to articulate an answer as a way to make the revelation of his point of view as satisfying of a climax as it is. If you take a step back and think about the overall flow of the volume's plot, it's quite the anticlimactic end to an uprising arc within a kingdom in the midst of turmoil. But at the same time, this anticlimax gives birth to an unbelievably satisfying climax for a volume focusing on Zenoba. After receiving a letter from Zenith's mother, Claire Latria, requesting that they bring Zenith to Millis at once, Rudius obliges and takes Aisha and Zenith on a family trip to Millis. There he is met with rage-inducing hostility from Claire, is attacked by the Temple Knights who sentence him to getting his hands cut off in an infuriatingly unfair trial for a crime which he didn't commit, and for his own safety is forced to kidnap the Blessed Child, who is at the centre of a deep web that is the power struggles within Millis. He is then led to a hostage negotiation over the Blessed Child, with the presence of leaders of various factions within Millis. Tension is high at the beginning of the session. Only a few scenes ago, Rudius was forced to fight the entire Anastasia Keep over incorrect information that he wished to kidnap the Blessed Child. But here we are. Rudius has kidnapped the Blessed Child, and is in a room full of very dangerous and powerful people, with knights surrounding him. We also know that in a different future, Cliff died in a comparatively simpler struggle concerning a god-tier incantation. So who knows what could stem from kidnapping the Blessed Child herself. 
Throughout the negotiation session, it feels as though things could erupt at any minute. Have they backed him into a trap? Are they stalling for time to capture Aisha? Rudius is on edge, but nothing ever comes of it. Rudius clarifies that he meant no harm to the blessed child, and that all he wants is to get his mother back, and it all just works itself out. Rudius is absolved, Zenith is freed, and Claire is sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment for kidnapping Zenith and inciting the kidnapping of the blessed child. And thus we have another volume that ends anticlimactically. But then, unexpectedly, Zenith stands up for Claire, and then so does Cliff, and then even the blessed child stands up for her. So considering the feelings of these people, Rudius concedes to forgive Claire if she gives an apology, but all he is met with is a snort. Throughout the scene, we keep getting the message of you should forgive her shoved in our face, and personally, I was quite sick of it. Rudius, and us by extension, gave her plenty of chances to apologize, but not only is she not remorseful, but she pridefully defends her actions, implying that if she could wind back time, then she would do it all again. So Rudius gives up. I have no intention of reconciling with someone who never tried to get along with me from the very beginning. So let's take a brief step back. Why exactly do we hate Claire? And what has she done to break someone like Rudius Greyrat? Someone who truly empathizes with the struggles of unpleasant people. It all stems from their first meeting. Sure, she treats Rudius rudely, she snaps at Aisha, and she demands that Norn be arranged to marry someone of her choosing. But Rudius is able to rationalize all of this. She's an upper-class woman raised in the religious capital of the world, who has never met Rudius, has an unfair but understandable bias against Aisha, and thinks little of Norn's future potential. All of the nasty things she has said and done can be explained away with this in Rudius's mind. But then she targets Zenith. She refers to her own disabled daughter as a thing. Rudius's loving mother, who, by no fault of her own, has lost all lucidity and autonomy after the teleportation incident. Claire implies that she only cares about maintaining the standing of the family name by stating that she will force Zenith into as many successive marriages to nobility as are required. She disgustingly states that Zenith's healthy body is a blessing in disguise, implying that she will force Zenith to bear more children. She is willing to take advantage of someone helpless who isn't aware of it and can't consent to it. And not just anyone, but Rudius's kind-hearted, loving, selfless mother who loved Rudius unconditionally and she had so happily and purely when she first saw him perform magic. The same Zenith who is now unable to do anything on her own, relying on the good nature of her family to help her get through life. This makes Claire a terrible, despicable, and unforgivable person in Rudius's eyes. But right as she is about to face her well-deserved 10-year imprisonment, we get the real climax of the volume, that is a chapter that reveals Claire's perspective. Claire isn't a bad person. She's vain, extremely stubborn, and strict, but she is not a bad person. In her heart and mind, she realizes when she makes mistakes and is in the wrong, but her vanity and stubbornness doesn't let her admit it. From her perspective, the meeting with Rudius went poorly. On slowly realizing how well-mannered and soundly reasoned Rudius was, in the face of her sarcastic and harsh words, she regretted how hostile she was being. During the meeting, she completely changed her outlook on Rudius, but because of the image she has of herself, she couldn't admit it or apologize. And beyond this, she was faced with an impossible scenario. Through extensive research, she had found that the only existing example of someone who was cured from a condition akin to Zenith's was a woman who slept with countless men. She knew that forcing this onto Zenith would lead to rumors and likely ruin the person who was found responsible for placing Zenith into such a situation. So she spouted terribly disgusting things about Zenith to intentionally anger Rudius, so that only she would have to take the fall for the terrible things that she would have to do, which to her mind were in Zenith's best interest. So she then kidnaps Zenith, but on seeing the face of her daughter up close, her daughter who she notices is already starting to grow old, she immediately realizes that her plan was wrong and that there's absolutely no way that she could follow through with it. But knowing deep in her heart that Zenith would want to be cured, she is faced with paralyzing indecision. And thus the chapter ends with us having a much greater understanding of the person that is Claire Latria. The point of this chapter wasn't to justify or excuse the nasty and cruel things Claire said and did, but rather to humanize someone we had perceived as a monster. It's the perfect climax for a volume that explores the importance of understanding the perspective of others. The anti-demon race faction, Rudius's one-sided trial, even the blessed child's ability to see your memories, and finally, Claire's point of view chapter. The theme of understanding permeates the entire volume, and Claire's chapter is the climax of all of this. 
showing us that you should attempt to understand the perspective of even those who you consider to be monsters. The fact that we ourselves were only a few pages ago cheering for the righteous justice being bestowed onto this cruel person makes the message of the chapter strike us even harder. Being open to understanding the perspective of others is important, as the actions one takes are not always reflective of the intentions behind them. And so, Claire burst into tears, she cried while making sobbing noises, cried while making a voice that seemed to say both I'm sorry and thank you. Zenith gently stroked Claire's face, and thus the curtain drew on the case in Millis. And with that, Shoku Tensei has done it again. Another character revelation that becomes the climax of its volume. A volume that was seemingly building toward a more traditional, action-oriented climax, which was undermined in an incredibly satisfying manner. The battle in the Bayeral Kingdom was an absolute marathon of a battle, and has already filled up Light Novel 25, and will likely end up spanning the entirety of Light Novel 26 as well. The battle clashes Rudius, Rugerd, Sword King Eris, Sword King Ghislaine, Silent Fitz, North Emperor Doga, Immortal Demon King Atof, Water King Isolta, North God Kalman II, and many more. Against former Sword God Galfarian, Ogre God Malta, North God Kalman III, Immortal Fighting God Batagardi, as well as Geese. The battle rages with a constant escalation in difficulty, with the participants slowly dropping out one by one due to death or fatigue until only one person from each side remains. Rudius Greyrat, tired and with almost completely exhausted manner, and immortal North God Kalman III, Alexander Ryback, wearing the Fighting God armor and wielding the Dragon King's sword. But just as Alexander is about to initiate an attack that would almost certainly end in Rudius's swift death, a chill runs down the spines of these two remaining warriors as Dragon God Orsted appears. What happens next is an anticlimactic end to a battle that had been building for chapters on end. Orsted fights Alexander, and swiftly, easily, and completely one-sidedly defeats him. We hardly even get any details of the fight. In a single line, we hear that the battle has begun, and we then immediately transition to a scene describing the aftermath. But this anticlimactic resolution is once again perfectly satisfying, all because of one fantastic revelation that becomes the climax of the battle, that Orsted chooses to enter the battle for the sake of his friends. By nature of his time loop and single-minded focus on his life's goal of defeating the man-god, Orsted's sole companion was solitude itself. But then he met Rudius Greyrat, a man who kept surprising him in a life Orsted had lived hundreds of times already. And much to both Rudius's and our surprise, Orsted began to respect him as a comrade and a friend. It's another fantastic example in a long list of people whose lives have been touched greatly by Rudius, giving meaning to his otherwise meaningless reincarnation. And so, we get the climax of the final battle in all of Mishoku Tensei, the once lonely dragon god putting aside his one mission that he has dedicated his life to for the past 20,000 years, and doing so with a smile on his face for the sake of his companions the final character revelation that becomes the climax. And there we have it. The final three story arcs in Mishoku Tensei end with a character revelation as their climax. The events in Sharon reveals a Nobu's journey toward an appreciation for human connection in life. The events in Millis reveal the human behind what we had perceived as the monster that is Claire Latria. And the events in the Bayeral Kingdom reveal the sense of camaraderie and companionship that had been brewing within Orsted thanks to Rudius' presence in his life. These character-based, climactic endings to volumes that superficially have their plot end anticlimactically are fantastic and are just one of many examples of what make Mushoku Tensei's web and light novels so unique and interesting.